Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show is coming up right next. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me, busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. I'm really excited about this interview, Benny. Jacob, Olivia, really excited, William, I'm really excited about it because, you know, I get a lot of books that don't quite, you know, take me to the edge of a conversation. What am I saying? What do I even mean by that? Don't quite take me to the edge. Well, they, they come out and they identify what everybody already knows and they just take it and they say it a different way. But Colby, Michael, no way at all is that what we're about to talk about. Because when I take a look at his book, which he's going to talk about in a minute, and we take a look at, the, at what the poison path is, and we take a look at poison path herbal, and we take a look at some of the herbs he's talking about. Oh, my gosh, is he actually even going to talk about nightshades? Really? Uh, now we're getting underneath... And you guys have heard me talk about this a lot in the past year of ancient wisdom. I say ancient because it's like beyond, it's even before like 2000 years. It's like goes like before, like way back when people looked at a life and they looked at a plant or they looked at a ritual and they looked at something and somehow in their lineage or knowledge transfer they knew take this grind it up here put it here don't do that with this they knew that and then we forgot but what's cool about this is it's not just about the item what about medicine magical wisdom what about access to the spirit realm when you look at and get to know some of the cultures that have developed rituals. It's hard to imagine that those rituals be lost in 10 years. That's why the people of Hawaii, you know, the indigenous people of Hawaii fought so hard to keep their language you know, to keep their rituals, to keep their momentum, to really transfer the knowledge. But today, I want to introduce you in to Colby, practitioner of the Poison Path, and you're going to find out what this is. What is occult herbalism? And what is it about what we've learned, or at least what I've learned, from what we're calling pagan wisdom, pagan archives. You know, that's such an interesting word. What I love about that is that word, when you take a look at it, you're really talking about people that use rituals and medicines to keep our species alive. And they weren't looked at as like something odd or weird. That's why in a lot of cases, we're still walking the earth. Colby, it's great to have you. It's great to have you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I, Manzanita sent you to Linda, and I, I bet you didn't expect to get a dose of this from me today. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Look, I want to just start with a conversation, and then I want you to talk about Poison Path. I grew up in a family both and and I ha- I learned later on about my mom's culture. You know, it was a big secret that my family on my mom's side, my grandfather was actually born in Brazil. That was like a secret. Nobody talked about that. 
But when I combine the rituals that I think about my grandmother and what she concocted, I don't have another word. You're going to school me on this today. <laughs> but when grandma's in the kitchen and she's grinding stuff up and she's yelling at grandpa that everything's got to be fresh, and you start to look at how she's using all of this. We never questioned grandma because the minute she put that stuff on our sore hand or our toe, or we drank it, we felt better. What is it about your life's path and about bringing this message forward that you want to make sure we don't forget? Yeah. Um, you know, the plant medicine has always been there. And like you said, it's, it's kind of gotten us to where we are. Um, you know, we wouldn't have a lot of what we do without it. And, you know, the, the medicine and the cures, they work. Um, you know, that's why you know, we still have traditional Chinese medicine that's been around for 5,000 plus years and Ayurveda and, and, you know, practices like that that have been maintained and all of this indigenous wisdom. Um, so just kind of reconnecting to that and a sense of that in my own practice and, um, you know, my own life connecting those things to my own background and, and worldview. So kind of investigating some of the, the plants that are, you know, native to the land of my ancestors, um, you know, Northwestern Europe, the British Isles, Scandinavia, things like that, because there is, um, you know, a big gap in that knowledge. Um, but I, I grew up working with plants and being in the garden and just being very close to nature. Um, with my grandparents, uh, and it was interesting, you know, coming from a, a conservative Christian Midwest household, um, you know, that I would <laughs> kind of develop that that reverence for nature, but I definitely did. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm shaking my head because I'm so right there with you. You know, it was very, it's very interesting to grow up in my household, right, with both my mom's side and my dad's side, but my mom's side of the family, they were very interesting. These are the Brazilian people that were afraid to admit they were, grandpa was born in Brazil. But imagine this, you grow up in that, that structure, you go to church, then you come back and you see all this other stuff going on, you know, in the kitchen. I want to talk to you. People may not know what we're talking about when we say the poison path. Mm -hmm. Let's explain the, um, the anesthesiology. All, let's explain all of the ologies about this, the roots, and why this is so important to remember today. Because can I just say something? I play a sport and I have a lot of Asian friends, right? I have a couple of them that were over in China when COVID broke out. And the way the Chinese handle COVID is the way they're handling now. They lock down, they just lock down. They lock you in a room, they lock down. But what I found fascinating in talking with her and gathering up what happened in those two months that she was locked in was fascinating to me. Herbal medicine, right? Special Chinese medicine, herbal medicines, teas, fungus, mushrooms, all of those things were available to these people and they really didn't know what they were treating, but they knew, they knew how to tap into this ancient, ancient knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I think you're doing. So tell everybody about Poison Path. Yeah, so the Poison Path is essentially looking at poisonous plants, psychoactive plants, um, any plant that has kind of a, a sinister or we call it baneful nature, um, <laughs> even certain invasive herbs, um, looking at them and kind of investigating our relationship with them, you know, mm -hmm. what makes them poisonous or dangerous or pernicious or, or unwanted and um, kind of investigating that relationship because really, you know, our, our association with plants and the different things that we them do are really just based on our own interpretation. Um, you know, they're a reflection of us as individuals and our society. Um, so we can learn a lot about ourselves when we look at, at the relationship with plants, especially plants that have had a, a major role in human history, you know, whether that's in medicine or warfare, 
um, you know, or even plants that have been involved in the war and drugs. You know, there's just a lot of a lot of information and insight that can be gained from our relationship to those plants and kind of investigating also the concept of poison. Um, you know, what makes something toxic? Um, you know, and understanding that in, in many cases, poison often just means potency and that many of these poisonous plants that have such a bad reputation are actually the the origin where, you know, some of these synthetic derivatives for some of our most important medications come from, you know, from things like foxglove, deadly nightshade, all of these, these plants that would typically be deadly, um, you know, also contain these powerful medicines, you know, so there's a really, I think that's sort of the, the main and most important yeah. lesson is investigating that duality. Yeah. And the reason we investigate it, because we know, right, historically, knowledge transfer, I don't know, centuries, generations, I don't care what you want to call it. Information is passed down that said or drove Bill Wilson to be in the hospital, fully alcoholic state, crazy town, and taken Belladonna. Hello, why was that? How did he even get that information to know that that was what he was going to take on his last day of having a drink? And then out he comes with the 12-step programs, right? And that wasn't the only thing he did. But how did he even get that? How did Bill Wilson find that? Like, what year was that? So this is what I mean by, and I love that you're doing, I just love that you're doing this book. Here's why. I contracted a mystery disease in 2000. And it was. And all of the conventional wisdom and medicine, all of the conventional natural medicine didn't quite work. Natural system. But it wasn't until we went down the poison path. I didn't know it was called this, though, Kobe. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, in a very structured, organized way, did I understand the power of bee venom, snake venom? I mean... I'm talking about it now. And for you, for anybody monitoring this on Google or Facebook, I'm sharing my personal experience. This is not for everybody. And I want to put the caveat out. What we're talking about today, you don't go out and experiment with this. That is the caveat today. You work with somebody that's knowledgeable to help you. But I also learned a word that I want you to talk about. Alkaloid. Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars are made with the alkali. But can you tell me about the way you're presenting this and how important it is in the interaction of medicinal remedies? Yeah, sure. So alkaloids are some of the most important chemical substances that we have. Um, we're generally using them in, in isolated or pure form. Um, so things caffeine to morphine to um, tropane alkaloids, which occur in nightshades. Caffeine. Nicotine, yes. <laughs> Things that we all use every day. The, the active, um, psychoactive component of the plant are alkaloids. Um, so in understanding their action, um, how they affect human physiology and consciousness, as well as understanding how to safely work with them, um, they become very important part of the path because the alkaloids are also what are potentially harmful or potentially poisonous or overwhelming. Yeah, I love the way you've written this book. I got to tell you this. I mean, I'm a little researcher at heart and literally my time, I do not have time to really get knee deep in this. But if I did have time, I'd probably study with you and learn some more about this hmm. because you are describing things that people most people don't want to talk about. And I love the way you're doing it. Everything from uh, to uh, 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 scopolamine. And I mean, you're explaining how this all works. Mm -hmm. How in the world did Kobe Michael get on this pathway in life? What the heck did you have to overcome in your life? Now, I'm not kidding. I mean, I wouldn't know anything about this if I wasn't dying for 10 years. But mm -hmm. what happened to you where you said, this is my life's path? Yeah, um, really kind of found me 
And, and looking back in retrospect, it makes a lot of sense. You know, I came from a divorced family. Dad was an alcoholic, so a lot of abandonment issues and substance abuse, substance abuse related things, you know, right off the bat and dealing with all the emotional turmoil of that. I think it was like the early 90s then. So it's not like a, a very popular thing to have happen yet. Um, and then just coming to terms with my own sexuality, my own identity, issues with with authority and just figuring out my own place in the world and then having and struggling with and recovering from, you know, my own substance abuse issues. You know, it was just sort of this recurring theme of, of altered states of consciousness you know, these really kind of deep, dark and emotional things that that I was going through. And I've always been in magical practice. I've always mm. considered myself a magical practitioner, um, very spiritual in that way since I was a little kid. And, you know, all of this is going on simultaneous to me learning about all of these spiritual things. And, and finally, I just discovered poisonous plants or at least um, you know the nightshades and then I find out that they've got all of this benefit for treating addiction and opiate overdose and alcoholism and all of these even getting into more of the the subtle spiritual things all of these things that were major themes and major struggles in my life have some kind of correlation with these plants I never knew why grandma after a big Sunday festival like with the tie, it's a lot of these people at the table, like the, ent- the entire Italian Latino people around the table, like food all day long, drinking all day. I never, I never thought about why the next morning she'd be grinding something up to give all the adults, right? Mm-hmm. And I still to this day don't know what she was doing. You say something in the book that I really want you to talk to. Thank you for sharing that personal story. You and I are not very different maybe different in age, but we're not very different in our life path. We're very close. We could two, we could be two peas in a pod. And I think those experiences when we're on sort of defining who we are and standing tall in who we are, and we have to really face the brunt of how courageous that is and how different it is in life and our families and our relatives, you know, it's not without wanting to numb ourselves. You know, the path that we may go down is like, wow, you know, I don't know how to talk about my sexual identity and why don't I just get numb about it? Maybe I'll find the courage, but you see, I'm hoping that in years to come, and I pray that that is not stigmatized as it is today, but you also talk about this. I've been fascinated by this. You say it is important that we not forget what brought us to these plants to begin with their practical use and growing prominence in modern witchcraft continue the ancient tradition with these powerful botanical allies. I have made statements that witchcraft has never been more popular. Why do I say that? Top culture, top television series, discovery of witches. I mean, you're not a witch. You're not it in the pop culture. And pop, I mean, come on, <laughs> Wanda. She is the Scarlet Witch. What? Wand of it. So here we are. Are we shifting and becoming a little bit more open, in your opinion? I think so. I think it it is sort of a representation of a, a shift back to the you know feminine side of things and and kind of seeing these just you know powerful female roles and, and not just in in people that are are physically female. You know, we all contain like that that female but I think there is a major kind of shift in our, our consciousness that's heading that way. And I think that the witch is a representation of that. And it comes to contain so many of the things that we're dealing with right now. Um, you know, pro-life, pro-choice things, women's rights, just all of this stuff. And kind of fighting in, in the face of, of the, the patriarchy, the man. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that you also talk about, and I want to just have you address this before we go to break, um, there are precautions. I mean, I wasn't joking before when I said, don't try this on your own. I mean, I would never have uh, tried some of the things that I did try, which have been tried by indigenous people, by the way, but I would have never done it without supervision. 
for me. Mm -hmm. There are precautions. I mean, I also reference Bill W. He was in a hospital when he did this. Tell us where you see the precautions when working with these plants. Oh, sure. So it's going to come definitely in the dosage and how or whether the plants are being ingested or, or just the, the way and vehicle that you're working with them. I have to make a statement. On my own journey, I'm telling you, when my practitioner and doctor said less is more, and I didn't believe her, that was that was a learning by doing that people shouldn't experiment. You really have to follow uh, the methodology, the rituals. You have to check for the purity of things. Um, I know that today we're going to give a copy of your book away. Um, but there is this burning question, and I, and, and I think you've answered it. It's about the why. You know, why poisonous plants? Why not just dot, dot, dot? Why not poisonous plants, I guess? Maybe, mm -hmm. right? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, great non-poisonous plants that are out that can treat a number of things yeah. medicinally and and. And, you know, massive large amounts can have oh, what yeah. we would consider toxic properties, but they're not always going to be as powerful for some of these, you know, deeper healings that we need to go through or, or helping to literally change your consciousness, or rewire your neural pathways, or, you know, in some cases, bring people back you know, the brink of death, using them, them in that way under a medical setting. Yeah, uh, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, we're going to give a copy of book away. We're going to talk about, I'm going to get back to Belladonna because we actually have uh, Belladonna ritual oil also to give away. Uh, Belladonna is a one of these, when you say Belladonna, it sounds kind of sexy. I think Stevie Nicks sang about it, but it's shown up in movies like Practical Magic. Uh, I've mentioned it four times, probably eight times this week. Why is that? But it's not the only thing you should know. When we come back, we're going to pick Kobe's brain. We're going to have him tell us what's on his top three list. And what did he discover in writing this book where he said, really? Wow. That? Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back with Kobe Michael. Hey, everybody, welcome back. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. I am so thrilled. As I said before, it's just wonderful to have Kobe joining us here today and to really be talking about, you know, what is so important, at least to me, you know, what I've discovered along the way is almost like ancient lost. And, and you know, I recently myself and my, my cousins, we've been looking out, you know, what can we paste together? And one of the things across, across the board that we come up with is what do we remember about our grandparents? What do we remember about what they've done? And this particular part here is something that all of us kids remember. And I was just saying to Kobe before the, you know, during the break, gosh, I said to my cousin, why didn't we pay more attention to this? Why didn't we watch this? And uh, he's, and he looked at me and he said, you know, we just didn't. And he said, remember, she didn't really speak English very well. <laughs> I said, oh, okay, that makes sense. Um, before we go on, we have a copy of Kobe's book to give away, Benny. 1-800-930-2819. Let's go ahead and do that. The um, uh, 1-800-930-2819. Kobe, can you give out your website? Because You've created much more than the book we're talking about. And tell us what people will find when they come to your website. Yeah, so my website is thepoisonersapothecary.com. And it is a collection of herbal formulas, amulets, um, medicinal and magical preparations, working with all of the plants that are in the book. Uh, a lot of the recipes that you'll find in the book are actually available on the website too. Um, so it's really just 
kind of a, a variety of, of what the poison path is and what it has to offer and sharing with people different ways that the plants can be worked with. Beautiful. Um, and as I said, Benny, let's go ahead and give a copy of the book away and then we'll come back to it. Um, you know, I want to hear from your perspective a little bit on as you were writing this book. And, you know, it's always a journey, I think, when you do something like this. You know, were there aha moments? Was, was there something that you found that where you said, wow, I knew about this, but I didn't quite know this? I think there were there were many moments like that over the years, definitely. It took me six years of research and about three years of actually putting everything together for the book to finally take its its final form. Um, you know, so one thing, just the realization of the amount of indigenous knowledge that that is still out there and the the risk that these people are at for having that knowledge being lost and the ways that that modern you know western anthropologists and things have, have gone to these parts of the country and time, kind of taken that knowledge and brought it back to the west to be used in modern medicine and just really completely changed the mm -hmm. the integrity of things and you know so that was a a big aha moment on um, that realization that mm -hmm. you know the lore isn't necessarily lost uh, we've just forgotten it in some parts of the world and it's kind of getting back to that original um, way of thinking um, that these these indigenous cultures have have maintained for all these thousands of years yeah i mean i want to i want to talk about this before we jump ahead i, I want to talk about your you know the great way you've outlined the three ways and in the book, you talk about the three ways. For those of you out there, um, there's so much in the book. It's, it's, it's quite a robust book. Um, but in the book, you talk about the crossroads of the path of poison. And in this particular chapter of the book, you also reference the three ways. There's a great uh, diagram in here you know, of a triangle. But it really is quite a powerful, symbolic message. And what I mean with that is the way you present a book, it has glyphs. Tell us about this. Tell us about, you know, threefold. Yeah, so that was kind of a, an idea that crystallized while I was assembling all of this information. And the three ways are using the three planets, Saturn, Mercury, and Venus to kind of categorize not so much the plants themselves, because there's often overlap between all three of those, but to categorize specific ways of working. And those specific ways of working relate directly to our most popular or prevalent folkloric witchcraft practices or, or things that would be typically associated with medieval European witchcraft or things like that. So the Saturn, Mercury, and Venus represents currents of working, um, so different methods of, of magic, talking to the dead, aphrodisiacs, um, traveling the realms, and those are all represented by those planetary archetypes as well. I love, though, the inclusion of, of aspects of astrology, what I call astrology in here, but you also reference, for example, Saturn, right? And I think Venus and Mercury as well, if I'm correct, I'm trying to remember now. Mm -hmm. But it's fascinating how you've created this, this beautiful web of pulling all this together to explain this, you know, to explain, yeah, this is how folks did it back then. And this is really what we could learn. Um, I was especially thrilled that you pulled out this whole section on Belladonna. What is our fascination with Belladonna? I don't know. <laughs> My favorite <laughs> but we team. are, right? It's like we are, like we're like, I mean, come on, like we are, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe yeah, talking to us. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot that it could cure right now that yeah. we don't necessarily know about or know enough about. And there's not really anybody with enough medical degrees willing to to do the research. Um uh, you know, from from addiction to to pain relief to you know working with the energetically yeah. for shadow work and things like that. There's just so many areas that it can help. 
Yeah. And then there have been people that have come along which have demonized, right? I mean, we always have that, right? Belladonna, the beautiful lady, right? What does Belladonna mean? That's just, right? Beautiful, beautiful lady. Woman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been used. Of course, it would have to be demonized at some point, right? But mm -hmm. it's been used in, in, in magical practice. It's like you said, been used in addiction. It's been used medicinally. I have referenced Bill Wilson. If you don't believe me, you guys can Google that uh, and look it up. But outside of that, do you have like a top three? I know Belladonna has <laughs> got to be your top three or you're like you wouldn't have spent this time. Yeah, she's that's my top one. Um, okay. Is Belladonna my main plant spirit ally and, and just really kind of represents to me the poison path itself and also that that kind of current of, of witchcraft. Um, other favorites would be Henbane is also a really, really awesome medicinal one that's a little bit safer to work with um, than Belladonna, but it has a lot of the same medicinal applications and things like that. So I'd, I'd love to do more of a, a scientific or investigation into that and as far as its treatment with, with opiate dependency. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Belladonna, Henbane. Um, Foxglove is another one that I've been working with over the past six months. And it was one that I was, wasn't always super attracted to. Uh, I started working with it as a flower essence to help with some heart issues. And that's been doing really great and have some growing over in the kitchen. And they're just really nice to have around. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, along these lines, these are, we're talking about, we're talking about plants, especially fox club which has gotten like everybody to say, don't eat it. Don't let your pet eat it. I mean, like, right. I mean, we already know that, but there's one category that has really, really, really gotten a bad rap across the board. And it's not only gotten a bad rap across the board, but it's also made it, made it to mainstream bad rap. Just saying the word nightshade, people think they know what that means. But it's really taken on such negative connotations. And I got to tell you, I grew up in a family, peppers, eggplant. I mean, these were like on the table. Talk about nightshades and, you know, how you address this and how you address them in your book. Yeah, so nightshades are one of our most important food crops and medicine crops, everything, eggplant, tomato, potato, um, tobacco. All of those are in the nightshade family or solanacea family. Um, solanacea comes from the Latin, which means to soothe. So a lot of these more potent nightshades also have a very sedating, um, soothing quality um, used for pain relief and anti-inflammatory effects and things like that. But they have to be done so in the correct dosage because at the larger dosage, they become much more stimulating um, and in some cases hallucinogenic and can even lead to, to coma, death, and, and things like that. So it's really important how to approach them. Um, but nightshades are kind of the, the favorite plant family of, of witches, of you know, those of us that identify are connected to kind of that medieval European witch archetype. Um, like mandrake, belladonna, henbane, and then later datura. Mm. You know, I want to take a short break. When we come back, what I want to ask you about is, as you look ahead, now that you've written the book and you've discovered so many things, I would love to know what you're most excited about experimenting with more. You know, which one of these? You know, there are some in here that I looked at and I thought, Wow, I, I wonder what he's doing with that. I, I, I wonder what he's doing with that. And then my friend said, you got to ask him about Juniper, what your obsession with Juniper is, Pat. You know, Juniper, you like drink the tincture, right? What is it about Juniper with you that you just cannot get enough of? And by the way, I don't overdose on it. I'm very mindful of it. But anytime I go to my naturopath, I walk in the door and I say, I need two things, colloidal silver and juniper. 
And then mm. she has to test me for it. And I either walk out of there with it or I don't. When we come back, what happens when we're drawn to something, as Kobe is going to talk about, and you want to know more about it? Stay tuned. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Thank you, Benny, for that. Hey, everybody, welcome back. Um, Kobe, right away, tell people again, name of your book, where they can get it from, but also tell people how they can find out more about everything else you've created. I mean, I, I've just, I've spent so much time on the website just looking at the beautiful things that you've created, right? You know, everything from the crow and belladonna rosary. I love rosaries, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but so much thoughtfulness and beauty that you put into this. It's just amazing. So how do people get the book? And then how do they find out more about what I'm referencing on your website? Sure. Um, so the book is called The Poison Path Herbal. Um, and you can get that anywhere books are sold, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. You can also order it on my website where I've got signed copies as well. And that's thepoisonersapothecary.com. Uh, and there's so much here, right? People can contact you if they've got any questions about it. Like I was looking at the super green that you have on here and I was just reading about it. You've got so, you, you've given people so much information. You're so descriptive about the way you do this. I mean, it's just really, really cool. So thank you for doing that. Um, let me get back to the question I asked you and the time I'd love for you to share about this. Here's where we are today, right? Clearly from my, where I sit, when I got sick in 04, this was just starting to be more mainstream. You know, whether you want to call it natural medicine, whether you want to call it herbal medicine, whatever you want to call it, it just started to come more to the forefront. Now, with the digital platform and internet, it's accessible to a lot of people. For me, I had tried every conventional approach, a lot of them, and it wasn't working. So I, out of desperation and out of some good luck, found a great naturopath, and we took this journey together. I want to ask you this question as you look ahead. What most excites you about looking ahead? And what are you most excited to learn more about from your book or from your work? <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> um, well, it's really, it's, it's a growing community. And there's a lot of people that are interested in working with plants like these and coming from all different directions, you know, from magical practice to psychedelic spirituality, um, into a more you know medicinal healing kind of a background and really just kind of fostering a, a sense of community and giving a platform for people to come together and you know, sharing other people's work as well and and just really kind of making a, a community thing out of it because so many of us could could benefit from it so I'm I'm most excited for the future just to see how things grow and see you know how many more people I can get involved or, and to help and, you know, just spread the word and, and things like that. Now, if you had to pick a couple out of the many things that you have, either on your website or in the book, give us your top three that you see yourself coming out more about. Um, the flying ointments are very popular. Um, they do have medicinal effects, but there's also, you know, some, some discrepancy on their psychoactive effects, their spiritual effects and things like that. So a project that I'd like to work on in the future is to somehow create a formula that is true to the medieval recipes that we do have that would give those more intense experiences to people that are looking for it but, you know, to do it in a way that they're disclaimered. <laughs> and what would say the name again? I just got a text. I want you to say what that is again. Um, the, the one that's the most popular right now is called the Unguentum Venenum. 
That's my my poison flying ointment with deadly nightshade, henbane, um, clary sage, mugwort, and I believe spike nerf in that one. Um, and they all work synergistically, you know. So it's not just one component that's making all of this happen. It's a right. blend of all of these different ingredients. Right. Um, give us another one. This is like hot off the press. This is like an exclusive. What's hot? by oh, Kobe gosh. Michael. This is like, <laughs> what's hot and what's not? <laughs> um, well, I love the rosaries. Everybody loves the oh, Belladonna yeah. and Crowfoot rosary. There's another one um, that's newer that's out. It's called a Deadly Nightshade Reliquary. And it's a really neat little spherical locket. Um, so it's all hollow on the inside. And then it has a Deadly Nightshade berry in the middle of it. Um, mm. So those are really nice to have around um, wearing as a talisman or charm. Yeah. Um, and when people go to your website, they're going to see and be drawn to the beautiful pictures you took. Thank you for doing such a great job at demonstrating what it is you're selling. So often, you know, people, we, I go to their websites and I go to their product page and it's like so teeny weeny, I don't even know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's also beautiful. I'm going to ask you a different question in the few minutes we have left. I grew up in an era where psychedelics, for lack of a better word, psychedelics started to become medicinal remedies. Now, of course, everybody knows the generation I grew up is just crazy. So most of the time they thought that's what we did. But there were a group of people, Ram Das, a couple of other people that really saw that there's a way to mental stability. And I need to put a disclaimer in here for anybody listening. This is an opinion that I'm giving and a personal experience from people I know. What do you think? Have we kind of overlooked the potentiality of that movement? And do you think it's coming back in a more safer way? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, absolutely, absolutely. You know, the there was not near enough research done on on LSD or psilocybin or or any of these psychedelics as far as their medicinal medicinal applications and I think that in part has to do with, you know, modern medicine, pharmacy and and all of that not wanting to treat people's mental stability because they don't make as much money that way. Um, but I think now, you know, with legalization or deregulation of, of cannabis and uh, mm. mushrooms in certain places that people are really starting to just see the benefit. It's undeniable. You know, yeah. you can't ignore these people have, have recovered from PTSD and addiction and trauma and abuse yeah. through microdosing. And it's not about getting high or numbing yourself or anything like that. It's, it literally rewires your, your neurological pathways. And we yeah. understand very little about that. And, you know, this is a really interesting conversation that you're going to have to come back and we have to do at least a half, we have to do a half hour show just on this topic because, you know, we're entering a realm now where more confusion about an ancient medicinal, which we call cannabis, right? I mean, come on, right? How old is that thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes everywhere. Plus years. <laughs> <laughs> and yet it's gotten a bad rap. And I think we're in a cycle where if we, if we could just truly do what you said and really put out, pull out the medicinal benefits. And I like microdosing. Thank you for saying that. Because every time I bring it up, I get an email that says, how can you be supportive of AA, NA, and 12-step programs so you can talk about this? Um, and I always answer that question privately. Mm -hmm. But the point is this. And by the way, I, they've asked me whether I use. And so it's interesting because I don't. But I understand the medicinal value of it. I've seen it. I've mm -hmm. seen kids that are autistic. I've seen this, and the only remedy comes from a pure, regulated, great practitioner that understands it. How much more do we have to learn about marijuana in the medicinal field, do you think? I mean, we're still discovering, you know, different medicinal uses and, and new isolates and things like that. I mean, I think there will always be 
something to learn from that plant in particular because there's just so many different yeah. uses and it's always been that way and that's why we've kept it or it's kept us um you yeah. know in, in easing people's minds i think there's a lot of societal stuff kind of attached to it and in the war on drugs being largely you know attached to it was more a war on race than a war on on drugs but I think we're finally, you know, starting to see some people rise up and, and get past that and, and to see that the, the benefits outweigh, you know, all the things that we've been told. Yeah. And by the way, even with you, you and so many like you, though, Kobe, you know, even when people go to look to buy something from your website, you have to have a disclaimer on there because there are states like Alabama where you can't bring this in but you can't even do astrology i don't think in alabama either so i'm just saying about that mm -hmm. but there are some places which i was kind of surprised about that you couldn't ship to i was really mm -hmm. shocked about vermont it ca caught me by surprise and so people have to really understand what is going on in their own world in their own politics in their own legislation that might be preventing this movement from moving forward. And mm -hmm. you know what? Saving more lives. I got to tell you, I can't share it on air today and I won't, but this latest outbreak we've had, so many countries use so many different herbal remedies before there was a conventional one. Mm -hmm. We just can't talk about it or we'll be banned. And yet it's sad to me. Kobe, thank you for today. I want to ask you one more time, please tell us about your website, how to get the book. And gosh, I'd love to know your personal message, what you want to leave us with. Sure. Come back and do that cannabis show with me, all right? Like a half hour. Yeah, absolutely. Okay? I'd love to. Okay. Bring some friends. <laughs> Bring some friends. Yeah. Because I really want people to know about how it's been used over history medicinally what we now learn about it, especially from TV, from CBD, post-traumatic stress disorder, what's being used and what's not being used, meaning what would it take for the VA to look at some of this? So thank you for today. Personal message, website, references. Yeah, thank so you. Personal message, thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed our chat. Uh, um, just remember that Poison simply means potency. It doesn't always ultimately mean death. Yeah. And that's important to remember. You can find out more about me, what I do, find my book, The Poison Path Herbal, and also some really awesome plant articles at thepoisonersapothecary.com. And I'm on social media at The Poisoners Apothecary as well. And how do people get questions to you? I got just got a question about that. How do we get questions to you? Yeah, so I try and be available on social media, Messenger, okay. Facebook, Instagram. There is a contact page on the website. You can email me at thepoisonersapothecary at gmail.com. I love it. Thank you so much for everything you're doing. And thank you for bringing this very powerful message out because I don't think people realize that even in the most contemporary world we live in, having conversations like this really are really acts of courage. They really are. We're not quite there yet. In the same way, we're not quite there with gay rights. We're just not quite there yet all across the board, everybody. But this is beautifully done. And you have created such a fine work of art for people to understand, appreciate, and want to know more. Thank you for that special gift, Kobe. Thank you for holding the space for me. You bet. Let's take a short break. Benny, if we could. Benny, Jacob, William, Olivia, for those of you out there, please make sure you visit the website. And there's going to be so much there. You just have to go over to the store and you're going to find a uh, shop rather. You're going to go over to the shop and what you're going to find are so many things, so many things, so many pictures. Oh, we couldn't talk about all of them, but they're all here. If you decide to click on one of them or you see it sold out, make sure you get in the loop right here with Colby to get that, like the Belladonna Black, the Belladonna, Belladonna Black Thorn of Mandrake, that's like on my list. All right, short break, Benny. Everybody, we'll be right back. <laughs> Oh,